Thank you all for joining us this evening. And tonight we're going to talk about A Bridge Too Far. A Bridge Too Far. I really like that name. In fact, that's the name of a movie I saw maybe 30 years ago, A Bridge Too Far. It's a, bridge, it's a movie about a bridge in World War II uh, where the Allies went out to capture this bridge. I believe it was called Remagen, uh, French, and uh, it was on the way to moving into Germany. And uh, it's a really great, exciting movie based on a true story for those of you who like those kind of movies. But I like the name because that name just spells of warfare, of attack and counterattack, a bridge too far. And that's exactly what I want to talk about here tonight from a spiritual point of view. Spiritual point of view. I want to introduce the concept of bridges, spiritual bridges. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So faith is that bridge which links up God to us and to that which we can receive from God. Mark 9.23 says that if you can believe, all things are possible. And that belief is a faith belief, a believing in your heart. For when you believe in your heart, when you truly believe in your heart, then actions and words will always follow that are consistent with and complementary to that belief in your heart. So that faith in your heart hooks up to God and we can have our prayers answered. Faith being that bridge that connects to God who's been given pleasure by our faith stance, by our words of faith and our actions of faith and produce the results we want. So in this lesson, we're going to look at some examples of bridges in the Word. And we're going to look at the fact that a major bridge is the bridge that hooks up the mirror of the Word, that we look into the Word and see ourselves where God sees us. And that mirror of seeing ourselves, faith is the bridge that takes that mirror and hooks it to the reality of our lives. We're going to look at the foundation of the bridge of faith. What supports it? How does it work? And what happens if that foundation is removed? And finally, we're going to look at a bridge too far. What happens when in spiritual warfare you reach out and you overreach your faith? You've gone to a point where your faith is no longer supported by its foundation. What when your faith is overextended, when you're overreaching your faith, it can uh, create a lot of challenges in your life. And that is the primary topic, part two. Tonight we just get a little tidbit of it. So going back to the beginning and looking at some links in faith. Maybe the most obvious linking the most obvious bridge, is faith is the bridge between God's grace and your salvation. We are saved by grace through faith. Grace is available to everybody who wants it. Salvation is available to everybody who wants it. But faith is what triggers the grace. Faith is what hooks up the grace with your salvation. Ephesians 2.8 You are saved by grace through faith. Another example of a good link, a wonderful link, is faith is the bridge, the link, that hooks up God's grace to the miracles in your answered prayers. In uh, Acts 14, verse 3, it says that they spoke boldly uh, and testimony being given about the grace and the signs and the wonders. That as they spoke boldly, the, the uh, boldness of what they're saying 
hooks up the grace to the signs and the wonders. We see also that faith is the bridge that connects the fruit of the Spirit, the nine part of the fruit of the Spirit, the escalator of the fruit of the Spirit, for those of you who've taken semester two here in school, each part is hooked together by uh, God's action and power are yours. But particularly, each part of the fruit is hooked to two other parts. There's love, joy, peace. So the first one, at the top of the fruit, love is hooked to God, and the second part is hooked to joy. And what makes them work coming down is primarily God's power and help coming down. But going up the fruit, starting with self-control, humility, and faith, it's primarily your action and your faith. And the one specific bridge or link I want to look at right here is the bridge of faith, where goodness and humility are hooked together by faith. Galatians 5.22 Goodness and humility are hooked together by faith, the bridge of faith. Humility is basically almost 100% your part. First Peter 5 verse 6 says, uh, Humble yourself under the mighty God, hand of God, and he will exalt you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he'll exalt you. God raises us up, and God blesses us when we walk in meekness and humility. So, the humility, the meekness, is hooked up to God's goodness. God's goodness is the presence of God's anointing, the manifested presence of God, to bless you with his goodness. Blessing us is part of his character. He wants to bless us. And his goodness, his manifested presence, produces that blessing that's available to us when we hook it up with our humility. So yes, with our humility, God wants to exhaust us. And he exhausts us because with the humility, we allow the faith to hook up the goodness, the glory of God available to us. Final example is that faith is the bridge which hooks up the miracles of the fruit of the Spirit with the actual manifestation of those miracles. So, we have the gift of the Spirit, and with the gift of the Spirit, by applying the faith, it's the uh, bridge that links up the gifts of the Spirit with whatever the manifestation is. A great example is in Acts 3.16, where Peter said, The name of Jesus because of faith in that name, has created this miracle, has healed the man and restored him, the man of the gate beautiful. It's the name of Jesus, God's part, and your faith in that name that has produced the miracle. Faith has hooked up God's gifting, and in particular right here, the name of Jesus, to the miracle. So there are many places where faith is that bridge that brings things that be not as though they are, that hooks up the supernatural with a natural manifestation. To me, the, one of the most important ones really is looking at the Bible as a mirror. God sees us through the blood of Jesus. The New Testament is written to show us what belongs to us because of the blood of Jesus. When we look at who we are and what we have through the New Testament, we are seeing ourselves through the blessings of the blood of Jesus, the cup of blessings. Every blessing that we have in the New Testament came through the blood of Jesus. So when we look 
at ourselves as to who we are, what do we have, what can we do, through the New Testament, we see what we have in Christ Jesus. We see our salvation in Jesus Christ. We see what we have through the blood of Jesus. And that's how God sees us, through the blood of Jesus. But when we read the Scriptures, and we see it, and we agree, it's as if we're looking into a mirror and we see ourselves. But then we walk away from the mirror, and hour, two hours later, we forgot what we look like. The longer you are away from the mirror, is the more you forget what you look like. You forget that when you looked in the mirror, there were some locks out of place, and you had to put them back in place. You walk away and you're forgetting about the locks, so no locks are falling all, all over. Maybe you even grow in dreadlocks, who knows? Okay? So when you walk away from the mirror, you will forget. Romans 12, 2 says that we should not be conformed to this world, but we should be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Transform. That metamorphosis, the word transform comes from the word metamorphoso, which is where we get the metamorphosis of one uh, shape of an animal to another, such as a beautiful butterfly coming out of a caterpillar who is not so beautiful. You're on all the duck climb becoming a swan. That metamorphosis comes to us starting with the renewing of the mind. But the renewing of the mind by itself is simply, simply called mental descent. You read the scriptures and you say, well, yeah, these are the promises of God. I believe them. I agree with them. But if you stop there and walk away from it, all you've seen is yourself in a mirror. You have to act on it. You have to be doer of the word. If you don't act on it, then you think, hey, here's what I am. Here's what I can do. The word says I can do this. The word says I can have this. But if you haven't acted on it, it's mental ascent. And the difference between mental ascent and true hard faith is one of the major areas where people overextend themselves. Because that's so well known, I probably won't spend much time on that next week. But that's an, that is an area of overreach, where our mental ascent exceeds what's in our heart. For mental ascent to get into our heart, you all know, you need to act on it. Action on what you know puts it in your heart. Sometimes that action can only be speaking. But as much action as you can do. That's a cycle of change. Renew your mind. Act on it to put it in your heart. Speak it out your mouth to guide and change your soul. And as your soul prospers, so will your health and your finances. That is the cycle of change. Here in school, semester two. So again, if you look at the mirror and walk away from it, you deceive yourselves. You have to look at the mirror and apply your faith to say, yes, not only do I have mental assent, I'm going to speak it. I'm going to affirm it. I'm going to declare it. I'm going to make it my own, and I'm going to act on it. And you do that, and it gets into your heart, and you take those faith action steps, and it becomes heart faith. And now you are believing, and you're acting. And that's the way faith bridges the gap from the mirror of the Word to the reality of what you want in your life. Now, finally, we want to talk about a bridge too far. Every bridge has a foundation. Every bridge has a foundation. If the foundation is weak, sooner or later, when a tremor, tremor comes, when spiritual warfare, warfare comes, the whole bridge will topple down. That's why the Lord says, build your house up on solid rock, not on sand. If your bridge is built up in sand, it's going to fall down. But we're assuming your bridge is built up on rock. Not up in sand, it's a good solid bridge. 
and we're going to look at what happens when you extend beyond the foundation. So what is this solid foundation upon which we need to build our bridge? And that solid, solid foundation is knowledge, knowledge of the word. Hosea 4 verse 6 says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. They are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And we see that so often. We see it as we look across the body of Christ. We see it in friends and neighbors. We see it in families where they're perishing for lack of knowledge. We see it in ourselves where somebody can look at me and see in me the most small little things I'm doing that are wrong. Whereas I, looking at myself, have great difficulty in seeing the big beams. So we can all look at others and see what they're doing that's wrong. And that can often lead to criticism and murmuring and backbiting and curses unknowingly. None of us listening to the service, participating in the service, would ever deliberately curse somebody, but accidentally we do it. Not knowing that we have great beams that we're not seeing. So, there's a lot we don't know. And what we don't know, that's how people perish. They perish for a lack of knowledge. So as we build our bridge, our bridge is being built upon knowledge. The bridge of faith is of faith. And faith requires that you have knowledge. If there's a promise of God, then it has conditions. If you do not know of the promise, you can't have faith for it. It is impossible to have faith for something you never heard of. Now, you may have heard of it, and you know God, the Bible says, this belongs to you, but maybe you don't understand the conditions, or maybe you never read it, so you don't know what the conditions are. But every promise of God has conditions. Now, if you don't know the conditions and you are acting to get the promise, then you're really not acting in faith. Uh, you're really acting on mental assent. To act in faith, you must know the promise. So the bridge of faith is based on knowledge. The base of the foundation is knowledge. But, the conditions are also an important part of the knowledge. So, knowledge and understanding of the information of the promise, the actual promise, and its conditions, these are that which makes up the foundation of the bridge. The informational content, if you will, of the promise and the conditions is an integral part of making up the bridge. But there's another part. The boundaries of the promise. You must know what the promise is, but you must also know what the boundary is. Because you can only have faith for the promise you know of within the boundary is set. And you're saying, well, sounds like a lot of words. Well, what does it mean? Well, look at Mark 11:24. You all know that, right? If you don't, there's going to be a $100 penalty. <laughs> Maybe a $1,000 penalty. You all know I'm just teasing, right? <laughs> the Word of God is not for sale. I'm just teasing. It's my strange sense of humor. Okay. Uh, well, Mark 11, 24 says, What things so you desire, when you pray, believe you receive, and you shall have them. So the promise is, whatsoever you desire, if you can believe it, then you can receive it. What are the conditions? You must desire, you must pray. Number three, most of all, you must believe that at a point in time, when you pray, it's spiritually done. You have received it. Then it shows up in the physical. So there's a promise, and there are the conditions. 
Your bridge is built up in that. What about the boundary? Well, the boundary is, number one, it applies to things. What things soever you desire. So you can say, well, I'm going to use this, and I'm going to pray for that person to be my wife, or to be my roommate, or to be whatever. You are praying for things. That's the boundary. A big boundary. People have actually done that. Now, number two is, it's whatsoever things you desire. It's not whatsoever things somebody else desires, it's what you desire. So in general, it's meant for you to pray for yourself. The prayer of faith is most generally a, pr- a one person prayer. It's you and God. Now, there are times when you can change a prayer so you're actually praying for it for somebody else. Somebody may need a job. You don't need a job. It's not your job. But the desire of your heart may be so much to bless them that you're praying for yourself, for the joy of seeing them blessed with a job, and so you pray for a job for them. But probably the most direct and best way to do it is do the prayer of agreement. You get the person, and both of you agree for the job for the person. So two boundaries on the prayer of faith. It's a prayer for things, not for people. And it's for you. No, beside that, as far as I know, there's no other, no other boundary. You could pray for anything. If you did not know how to get saved, based on Ephesians 2, 8, and Romans 10, 9, and 10, you could use Mark eleven twenty four and get saved. Assuming you knew that salvation existed. It's a thing, and it's for you. Now, that's not the best way to get saved, and it may take longer, but it could be done. So there's the boundaries and the conditions. Now, if you overextend your faith, if you start praying and extending your faith beyond the level of your knowledge, then you're liable to run into a lot of challenges. I remember this man, and he, as his first adventure into buying real estate, he bought a number of acres of land back up in what had become Apple Valley. A long time ago, that time, you know, nobody, nobody even knew the word Apple Valley. There was not much happening up there. And he bought it. He felt that God wanted him to buy it, and he bought it. And then he said, here's the money I want. He picked a humongous price. And year after year goes by, it wasn't coming. But he didn't budge. He says, this is what I bought. God wants me to buy it. And I'm going to uh, I'm gonna get it. He did. But it took about 20 years before he got it. He, he believed God told him to do it which is a good start, an ex- excellent start. But he had no experience in real estate, no experience in property. Uh, and so he picked a number, basically because it sounded good to him. He didn't pick a number that was consistent with normal growth because he had no experience, no knowledge in that area. He went outside his level of experience, outside his area of experience, and picked a number and started standing in faith for it. But he was patient. So he patiently waited. He could afford to wait, fortunately, because if he couldn't afford to wait, he would have to to sell it and take something less. So you can exceed your bridge. You can exceed your faith because you have no knowledge. You may have knowledge of the promise, but you don't have knowledge of the things that go with the promise. Somebody could say, well, you know, I'd like to be the CEO of a Fortune 500 corporation. They could do that. 
But if they've never worked in the corporate world, if they've never studied business, they're exceeding their knowledge. And what they should do at that point is start getting the education and experience to move towards it. Just because the scripture says, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe you receive, It is true, you can, you can pray it for anything, but you're praying it for something based on mental assent, not on heart faith. You can't have a heart faith for something for which you have no experience. You're not even close to it. So, you know what the Word says, and you reach out for it. Now, if you're willing to take a bunch of failures, and a lot of challenges along, along the way, and you wait patiently for it, it will come. But in the meantime, it can be very rocky, rocky ground. I know somebody who's standing in faith for something, and he has literally done over five million affirmations. Five million affirmations. Now, I believe if he continues, he will get his manifestation. But I think along the way, it will speed it up if he focuses in more on what's delaying it, what are the hindrances. What kind of experience does he need to move forward in it? And this is something that I have told the person before, and I'm sure he's working on it. Uh, but it's a particularly challenging manifestation that this person needs. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most challenging things for which to get a successful manifestation. But the faith to do that, it certainly has the faith, it has the diligence to do it. The tremendous diligence and patience to do five million uh, affirmations. He's committed to doing it. I think he will continue doing that manifestation. He'll continue doing the affirmations until he gets his manifestation. But I'm praying that along the way he will see some of the hindrances because we all have hindrances no matter what we're trying to do he will see what are some of the hindrances are, and I'm you know, praying that he will see one or more hindrances, which when he removes them, he will get a sudden manifestation. I remember this famous speaker who was praying for his daughter to have warts, I guess they were, if I remember correctly, fall off her face. And uh, he did thousands and thousands of affirmations. I don't know how many, but at least way back in that time when I first heard this, that sounded like an incredible number of affirmations. And he just hung in there. That is as far as I can tell from his writing and from what I've heard, that's all he knew was to do affirmations for his daughter. And lo and behold, one night she went to bed, and the next morning she got up, they had all fallen off. But it took a lot of affirmation and it took a long time. So, when we overreach our faith in any way, shape, or form, either by uh, moving out of the area of the actual promise, or because we don't have the experience to go with it, or because we are have hindrances or doing actions or saying things which contradict what we're trying to do. For whatever reason, when we overextend the faith, uh, quite often the most likely thing to occur is a very long wait. But actually, that's really the good one. <laughs> Maybe a long wait. One man was 20 years, the other one has done 5 million, uh, affirmations, but you know what? It can be a lot worse. 
Because when we do that, we often open the door to spiritual attack. And a lot of challenges can come about. Because a spiritual attack can open up strife and confusion and doubt and condemnation, you know, self-condemnation, guilt. A lot of things can come. And things can really go out of control pretty fast. It takes a person of real faith and great diligence and great self-control to pilot a project like that to maintain a fit action plan for a year, seven years, and you one lady who did it for seven years. At the end of seven years, she got a manifestation. Tremendous manifestation. Tremendous miracle. Has not had a, had a challenge with that particular problem in her body since she got the manifestation, which was, I think, 15 years ago. But it took seven years to get it in the first place. But I bet you in the seven years she didn't do five million affirmations. So all those things can be difficult and challenging. You know, if you look at patience, James chapter 1 tells you that patience comes through experience. But not only is patience coming through experience, it has to be patience coming through experience that you're accepting and living joyfully. You start going off into grief and condemnation and depression and all these various things you could do. Anger, getting offended at God. It can open up the door for a lot of attacks. So the best way to do it is try to match your faith, your project plans, your faith action plans, match it with the foundation of your bridge and with your experiences. The kingdom of God is like a seed. It grows gradually. Now can the one seed get so big that when it comes out with the harvest at the given time of the year, you can't even count the fruit? The answer is yes. Very common. But it didn't get there overnight. It's little by little by little. If your jumps are not little by little. You're probably running on mental descent. And can you get it? Yeah, but how many people have the courage and the guts to wait seven years for physical eating? Or do five million affirmations? Or 20 years to sell a piece of land? Or what else? All the other examples we have. I mean, I wonder how much more money this man would have made if he had taken a decent property turned around and bought something else and resold it two or three times in the 20 years. My guess is going to made a lot more money. So, you want to match your faith and what you're praying for with the foundation. You don't want to overreach your faith because if you do, it can lead to challenges. If you overreach your faith on the basis of the knowledge you have, then it can lead to the things that I just told. Now, if you overreach your fit by going outside the boundaries, oh, then you can move into an area called presumption. And the greatest example of presumption is when the devil said to Jesus, the devil knew that Jesus had come to win back the kingdoms of the world. So in the three temptations, he offered the kingdoms of the world to Jesus. He said, hey, all these have been delivered to me. I'll give them to you if you bow down and worship me, which Jesus wouldn't do. But before that, on the temple, the devil said to him, this is my translation, hey, you're a great man of faith. You know, you can do anything. Jump off this temple because it's written that the angels would bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. No, had he done it, that would have made presumption. Yes, angels would bear you up. But the implied, the implied uh, condition there is when you have a challenge or an accident and so forth. It's not like, oh, well, I'm gonna, somebody says I'm going to drive my car at 100 miles an hour and pray that I don't get killed. Well, I don't think that's a good thing to do. I always say it's presumption. So, exceeding the boundary, going outside the boundary, leads to presumption. So uh, next week, we'll pick up on this, 
and look at the various ways we can overextend our faith and how to recognize them and what to do about it. So thank you very much for your patience and in Jesus' name I pray that the Holy Spirit will take what I have taught tonight and for each of you show you different aspects of it that's exactly what you need to know. Including show me also. In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay. A bridge too far. Wow. Some good some good thoughts in there because we're all in a process of learning and growing. And we make mistakes. But we have misunderstandings. And so it's good to get some of these things clarified. We can take these details that Apostle Joshua has given tonight and see how they apply to us in our situations. Does this apply to us? If so, we need to make some adjustments then to get in alignment with the Word of God because God wants to bless us. He loves us so much, and he wants to bless us so much. But we have to do things his way and partner with him for him to be able to do as he desires to do for us and with us. So... Thank you, Apostle Joshua. We're looking forward to next week's teaching also. So as they like to say, stay tuned. There's more coming, and it gets even better. Praise God. So let's take a moment to confess sins, and then we will come to the table to partake of the body and the blood of our Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your word. For your word teaches us that on that night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread. He blessed it and broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Those 39 stripes that you took on your back. Oh my, I can't even imagine. I think all of us feel the same way. We can't even imagine how terrible that was, how painful, how much you suffered on our behalf, taking every sickness, every disease, every infirmity, and every pain for all of us, for all men, for all time, so that we would not have to suffer so that we could live in healing and health and wholeness and wellness and restoration and rejuvenation in every part of our beings from the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet. How glorious this gift is. Oh, Lord, we appreciate you. We appreciate what you have done for us. And we want to say thank you by walking in the fullness of manifestation of every single challenge that comes against our bodies, that we're able to make that like a boomerang and bounce it right off the anointing on our bodies and send it back to the devil and say, we have been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Symptoms you don't belong to us. Sickness, disease, infirmity, and pain, you don't belong to us. Go! In the name of Jesus, for we are the temples of the Holy Spirit of God Almighty. And all of that junk from Satan does not belong on God's temple. It does not. And we need to just firm up ourselves and say, oh, I'm not just going to accept this. No, I'm not just going to put up with it. I'm not just going to tough it out. No, Jesus paid a horrible price for us to live in health and healing and wellness. So let's grab hold of it and let's run with it and let's do the spiritual warfare necessary when there are symptoms still in our bodies. We probably all are experiencing something 
that isn't quite the way it should be, that doesn't line up with the Word of God. So let's tell our bodies, body, line up with the Word of God. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed by the stripes of Jesus. For we are the healed of the Lord, and we say so. In Jesus' precious name, let's partake of the broken body of Jesus and take this and put this into our bodies and transform them from broken to whole by the power of the stripes of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. You've asked us to remember, and we remember what belongs to us, and we remember how we get there. And we give you all praise and glory as we now partake of the broken body. In Jesus' name. And in the same manner, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you for remission from sins. This do in remembrance of me. I'm sure the disciples looked at him and thought they had no clue what he was talking about. What's remission from sins? They were used to doing annual sacrifices every year to pay that price for sin. Remission, remitted, washed away. Once and for all, that's what remission of sins is all about. And with remitting of the sins comes remitting of the wages of sins because if there are no sins, then there's no wage of sin. And so we're free from all of that because of the sacrifice of our Jesus. He gave his life. He gave everything he had for us. He poured out every last drop of blood, pure, powerful, holy, available to us to use right here, right now, in this day and age, in every day and age. We call upon the blood of Jesus for our life, for strength, for help to the promises, the fulfillment of the promises, as we do our part as laid out in the Word of God. And the Word of God, you'll notice with the promises, always has, if you do this, then God will do that. So once we fulfill our part of the bargain, our part of the partnership, then God is faithful and just to carry out his part and to assign our angels to carry it out for us. It's a wonderful, wonderful way of living. It's a wonderful gift living in the kingdom of God, living as children of God Almighty, who loves us so very much and sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, for each one of us. We are so blessed, so very blessed. And we love you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for all that you have done for us. We remember, we rejoice, and we now receive of your blessings. In Jesus' name, we partake together. 